the big thing about chronic pain is that it can uh, pull you in completely. And one of the things that we found uh, through the centuries is that when you're when you're in pain or you're hurting, if you can help someone else, you feel better. My name is Don Hunter. I'm a psychotherapist, registered social worker in private practice. Uh, I spent 12, about 40 years working in uh, the field of mental health at different hospitals and clinics and uh, started my private practice in uh, 1987 and been doing that part time ever since. Uh, I just retired from Sick Kids Hospital in November, so I uh, increased my private practice to three days a week instead of uh, two. Um, but it gives me four day weekends all the time, which is lovely. Um, nice. I, and so the, the whole issue that we're sort of focusing on today is the, is the chronic pain, which started in, uh, November, 1981. And, uh, basically, uh, it's never gone away. Uh, it sort of varies and, and like, uh, with the weather, it varies and with stress and anxiety and stuff like that. It, uh, it can make it worse. Uh, so it's trying to manage it uh, all these years and uh it's been a, a bit of a trip which is the uh book right and so yeah the book that we are talking about is chronic pain my journey oh, there's so many different ways or, or so much in here that i kind of wanted to pick your brain about so to speak so maybe i guess i'll just start and uh so i st have a note here uh, in the beginning of the book you write in the introduction, this sort of comment here, I'll just read it and then you can comment on it. So my determination to work, provide for my family and become the best therapist I could, could be, has been my greatest ally in this battle. I battled the pain, frustration, worry, fear, sadness, helplessness, anger, and hopelessness every day. It begins with an awareness of pain leading to worry and fear of how bad it will get. I use various techniques to eliminate or dull the pain, but they don't provide significant relief. I, I guess I'll read one more sentence. This triggers the frustration and anger, which makes the pain worse, leading to the helplessness and hopelessness. So I guess I, I thought it was a good example of how you, and you comment on this throughout the book, but how your, I guess, motivation or desire to work and be of service and provide for your family was a huge antidote, so to speak, to the... I, does it still keep you going, I guess, is another question. Yeah, I mean, I just had a... Uh, conversation with a friend of mine because uh, we were talking about how now that I'm semi-retired I have extra time on my hand so I volunteered uh, I volunteer with Dying with Dignity Canada um, so I do uh, right now I'm doing a death dialogue group which is uh, interesting that's four sessions um, and uh, using my time has been a big issue because if I don't have something what he said to me was that he said you accountable your motivation is being accountable for something i thought that was very insightful and, and that really hit home with me that i need so i need to be accountable to somebody so i'll get up and do it <laughs> um because if i if i'm not the tendency is for me just to give in forget it it's too hard kind of thing. right can you i guess talk a little bit about kind of your past or your history, like how you got into the field. There's lots of great stories in the book about, you know, fighting with friends or doing perhaps um, risky behavior as a teen, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, or being sucked into that with your peers. Yeah. Um, and maybe a bit about your family. So one note I have here, which I think is always interesting that comes up. Oh, Let me remove my sticky note here. You say, however, in spite of my mom's empathic abilities, communication in my family regarding emotionally sensitive topics was not one of our strengths. Dad had a rather short fuse. And you sort of go on to explain those situations. Um, yeah. I, I often think you hear it so much, but everyone says in my family, they don't talk about things, these things, or in my culture, we don't talk about these things or whatever it is. Yeah. And I just curious if you could comment on sort of how that, that seems to be just the nature of humans, or maybe we're changing a little bit now, but I mean, it does seem to be quite common. And yeah. then Maybe you can tell us a little bit about oh. yeah your childhood and adolescence and how you got into this yeah. type of work. Sure. Um, 
first of all, uh, I was always on the periphery of groups. So I had uh, one group of friends and that's where we, I talked about feelings and emotions and we were quite connected. And then I had this other group that were sort of deviants. And uh, there was, there was something that was attractive about that risk taking behavior that, that pulled me in. And I, and I wonder sometimes if it was more just curiosity about you know, what's this all about and how, how much risk can you take uh, and not get into big trouble, right? Um, so that I was sort of on the periphery of those two groups, more involved with the, the uh, emotional, we'll call them, I can think I call them the hippies in the, in the, in the book. But uh, we were all sort of in that era and um, we used to... Uh, we would take, I lived in Scarborough, grew up in Scarborough, and um, we used to take the bus uh, downtown to Yorkville to go to the clubs, and um, we would be in bare feet. <laughs> so, you know, walking the streets, Yorkville, Toronto, Young Street, with, in bare feet. Um, it was such a clean city back then, you know? You didn't, <laughs> you didn't ever worry about stepping on glass or something. It was great. Um, but kind of weird looking back on it to think that people did that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we sort of, uh, it was that sort of, uh, which group do I stay with kind of thing when I was younger. And I think one of the things that attracted me to the group that uh, is more hippie, sort of open, accepting everything, was that uh, they were the ones that were using drugs, not alcohol. So and I, I, I didn't like the alcohol in the other group. As they, they always got drunk and people throwing up, it drove me crazy. Um, so I sort of started hanging out more with the other group and, and eventually left that other one, thankfully. Um, and I think there's a couple of those people that are in prison now. So it was a good, good <laughs> big call. Um, anyway, I had in through school was interesting because I never, uh, I always scraped through uh, in elementary school. Um, and every year the teachers would tell my parents that I wasn't applying myself and that I, if I didn't do that, I'd never get anywhere in life and uh, all that kind of thing. That didn't sway me at all. I just kept messing around. I was a bit of a clown in class. And uh, I w that was my goal was to make people laugh and uh, disrupt the teacher. Because um, I, I had some good teachers, but I had more teachers who were difficult and, and uh, authoritarian, which drove me crazy. Um, so I ended up getting uh, in trouble more than anything else. But when I was graduating grade eight, the principal said to my parents, you can't go to a, he can't go into an arts and science program. He doesn't, he's not smart enough. Um, so he needs to go to a tech school. So they screened me into Cedarbury Collegiate and I was in uh, all the shops in uh, and I had math, science. I had math, science, and, and uh, chemistry, I think. And the rest were all shops. And uh, my first report card, uh, I was getting like 80s in the uh, in the science, of math, and, and uh, chemistry, and barely scraping by in the shops. Um, there was a time where I almost electrocuted my uh, my <laughs> teacher. He said, you know, we were, we were wiring a building outside the school. Uh, so in woodwork, we created this building, we built the building and then in electron electricity, we sort of wired. It. So we had wired it and he said, uh, okay, so turn, uh, turn on the, on the, turn on the power when I tell you Hunter. So I was standing by the switch and, uh, I thought I was sure I heard him say, turn it on. And I turned it on and he screamed and pulled his hand away from the socket. And so I was like, what the hell are you doing? Try to kill me. Uh, so, um, <laughs> and he said, as long as I, uh, as long as I agreed to not go into advanced electricity, he would pass me in the course. <laughs> so, okay. That's fine with me. Anyway, long and short was through high school. It was, I didn't, I didn't gel with any of the people at, in the, in the shop program there. Uh, uh, they were basically, uh, you know, misogynistic and uh, sexist and, uh, and into fighting and stuff like that. And that's not what I was into. So, um, 
and the teachers were, were just as bad. <laughs> and by the time I got to grade 11, it, I was like so fed up. Um, I didn't know what to do because I was getting high marks in all my academics, but blowing all the shops. So uh, I came back for grade 12. And in that first month of grade, grade 12, I had an English teacher that was um, a real asshole. And uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, he said something about the book we had read and I sort of put up my head and gave my opinion, which was the opposite of his. And he said something like, um, uh, Hunter, how did you, how did you get to this grade and be so stupid? You get here and be such an asshole. And I, I and you was, wrote that in the book, right? Yeah. yeah. I was so angry. Yeah. I just dumped my books on the floor and I left and I never went back, never went back to clean up my so I never finished high school. I never got my grade 12. <laughs> so, right. uh, so then it was, you know, yeah. go to work. So I worked for a few years in the shipping room at the place where my dad worked. And, uh, and that, that sort of made it certain that that's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then I was trying to figure out, so what, what options do I have? At the time, my older brother was into Zen Buddhism and meditation. So he was, uh, he, I was following him a little bit in that regard. And he was uh, teaching me how to meditate and, and I really sort of fell into it and, and I just found it incredibly helpful and beneficial for me to go right. and sit in the field and contemplate life um, for hours. Can I, can I ask you about that just sort yeah. of randomly or, or I don't know the kind of history of how sort of mm -hmm. mindfulness started coming into the West, but was that like Alan Watts kind of stuff yeah. or was there Jack Cornfield? I don't know if Jack Cornfield was around back it was then. Later. Or... Oh, that was later. Okay. But yeah. Alan but Watts. Al well, he yeah. was around at that time. Yeah. And Philip Kaplow was the sort of the guru of uh, Zen Buddhism. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so you started getting into into that, spending more yeah. time outside. You you write in the book too that you sort of started to develop, and maybe you did this actually younger than at this time, but you did yeah. develop a relationship with nature and sort of being outside and connecting. That was early. That yeah, that was when I was uh, seven, eight, nine. So yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And that so that continued. Point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, so you're in your 20s, or you're after high school. You're getting into to Zen Buddhism, yeah. And then, and then, how and then I trans. Well, yeah. Then I realized I needed to. I really needed to get an education and do something that <laughs> um, that I enjoyed um, for a career. And at the time, uh, my friends and I were involved in um, a youth group in the local church, and uh, we we sort of dropped in one night to it and and uh and thought oh this is interesting all these kids are, are here and then there's a whole bunch of kids out on the street you know doing drugs selling drugs and getting into fights and gangs and stuff there were a couple of gangs that started it there and uh so we sort of thought well why don't we get involved in this and try and bring more kids into it so we did that for uh um well probably a couple of years and we were involved in what we did was we uh we sort of were all into music and we all played instruments. So we started, we wrote a musical and, uh, mm. and cast it and put the, got rid, had auditions with kids from the streets. And we finally uh, got it cast and, and put it on and it went over really well. So it was like, uh, that was like, okay, so this is great. Like helping people is really cool. Um, so I started to really like helping people and, uh, in my core group, if people had issues or struggles or anything, they'd always come to me and talk to me about mm. it, and, and I'd give them ideas. So um, that felt really good. So I picked up the uh, um, the booklet for Centennial College, all the courses they offered, and I was flipping through it. And by process of elimination, I, I came down to two possibilities. One was early childhood. The other one was child and youth work. So the early childhood was a two-year program. The child and youth work was a three-year program, um, but it opened more doors, I felt. So I went with the child and youth work by process of elimination. And that was mm -hmm. that was where I sort of realized that's where I belonged. So 
yeah, and from there it just grew. Right. Okay. And and I want to ask you sort of as this was happening in the book too, you start uh, you talk about being aware of my note was moral reality if there is such a thing, but. So you say, one time when I was walking along the bank, so this was in the, the ravine near your house, I assume, Yeah, I was poking a walking stick I had picked up along the way into the creek bed. Um, and you go on to see where you noticed a large brown furry object floating in the middle of the creek. It was the swollen body of a dog. As it floated mm-hmm. by me, I felt so sad. Do the owners not know where their puppy is, I wondered. There was nothing I could do, so I continued on my journey, thinking about life and death and wondering if there really was a heaven and hell. I wasn't sure I believed in such places, but I had a powerful sense that it was important to be a good person, to care about others, and to try to be helpful. I I guess I think a lot of people struggle with that, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a good person? Is there an objective moral reality out in the world? And how do we fit into that place? And then so much of our suffering often comes from perhaps not living in alignment with that maybe, or or I don't know what the word would be um, and how you conceptualize that also in like helping people. Um, Do you find that it's a bit of a sidetrack and I want to get back to the story, but yeah. In your own life, how does that fit in? And then also how you see that in other people and how that might help people when they connect to that. Well, I think that uh, the big thing about chronic pain is that it can uh, pull you in completely. Yeah? And, uh, and one of the things that we found uh, through the centuries is that when you're, when you're in pain or you're hurting, if you can help someone else, you feel better. That mm. somehow that helps you to feel better, and and it may have more to do with the fact that you are um, doing something really positive for somebody else. Um, but the other piece of it that clicked in when the pain got worse um, was that when I was in a lot of pain, um, and I had to go in and do a session um, with the family, or whatever. Um, I developed the ability to sort of almost block out the pain and mm-hmm. and focus. It helped. It actually helped me to focus more uh, completely on the story that was being told to me by the people I was seeing. Um, so when I had when my pain was at eight out of ten, I felt that sometimes that was when I was the best. Mm-hmm. So it, wow. and not. Yeah. Yeah, so that just sort of grew, and I started to realize that that was an important factor for me. And that sort of comes comes back to my friend's comment about being accountable. Right, right, right. And yeah. and how about let's add this? Um, you you talk about this story too. I think this was more middle school is esque, where you threw a knife at the feet of your friend or something, and or you got in a fight with a buddy, and then you kind of yeah. got in trouble for it, but. So you recognized your part in it and you were able to say, well, that guy's kind of a dick and I'm Mm. not going to hang out with him anymore. And I think sometimes it's, that's an insightful example because often people, Mm. I guess, have difficulty distinguishing between, you know, I did something bad or I behaved in a way that I'm not okay with, so to speak. And I can uh, acknowledge that. And then I can also do things to reduce the likelihood of that behavior happening again, or I can put exactly. boundaries around myself for... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the first first evidence of that for me was in grade... And I think I wrote this in the book too, was in um, grade six. Uh, there was a guy who was constantly teasing me um, and he was driving me crazy and he wouldn't stop. And the more I got upset about it, the more he teased, right? Which is typically the, the scenario. So the long and short of it is I ended up deciding in my mind that I'm not taking it anymore. So I ran towards him, uh, tackled him to the ground and had my hands around his throat. And I was really angry. And as I had my hands around his throat, I was thinking, this isn't right. <laughs> this is not, this is not good. <laughs> this doesn't feel good. Doesn't look good. I need to stop this. And I just sort of squeezed and said, leave me alone or I'll kill you. And 
walked away. <laughs> and he never teased me again after that. So that worked, thankfully. I don't know what I would have done if it didn't. But uh, yeah, right, but right. That's, that's sort of, it scared me, that anger. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Scared me. Yeah. And then the other one was yeah. when I uh, threw the knife uh, at my buddy who uh, shooting right. Right. keys at me through a gun. Right. And and can you maybe talk, maybe in this can transition us into some of the really interesting clinical stuff you write about in the book. Where do you think the place for adolescent aggression is? Or obviously, it's inevitable. Human aggression is inevitable. Certainly at teenage teenagers and teenage boys usually express it through violence or physical things like that. Teenage girls tend to be more gossipy and sort of social, uh, moral assassination type of aggression. And, and then you, you sort of, another point to that is you mentioned how your anger and frustration to the social injustices at the time. So racism, misogyny, those kind of things, how you kind of used or you directed that anger and frustration to being of service to the world. And I think so many young people, I certainly struggled with that. I turned it inward. I just got mad at myself and at the world, but I didn't do anything about it. I just stewed and got resentful. And then maybe that first, but I think it connects a little bit to, I was really interested to see when you started writing about working in Whitby, I think it was interesting. My grandmother used to work there as a nurse. Yeah. Amazing. I was asking my mom the other day, I think she she retired about 10, 15 years before you got there. Um, but so maybe let's just do the adolescent aggression thing first and then move into, you talked about sort of the restraint and different ways of restraining really sick patients or clients or whatever. So maybe the first, the adolescent aggression, and yeah. then maybe you can talk us into how you got into the clinical work. Yeah. And stuff. Well, I think the, the aggressive piece of it, and it all comes from that sort of anger that gets triggered. Yeah. So that happens to all of us. And when that anger gets triggered, um, there's a, there's a brief second before you respond. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. the tendency as a young person, cause you don't have much experience is to just respond naturally to the anger. So you, you lash out, uh, verbally, physically you lash out. Yeah. So at the time, I think, I think, and I would attribute this to my work in meditation, um, mm. that, uh, this is a natural process that things are going to happen that trigger these emotions in us, the anger in us. Um, but the notion that we have a choice of how to respond became a focus for me. So when I, when something would trigger the anger and I would feel that urge to strike out or to scream or yell or whatever, uh, I would pause for a second and say, oh, interesting. Here that, here's that anger again, right? And then actually, I don't want to do that. I don't really want to hit him in the face. <laughs> I feel like that, but I don't actually want to do that. So I'm not going to do that. Right. So it's realizing that we have a choice in how we respond to the emotions that come up. And it's harder. I think that, you know, we've learned over time that it's harder for people who struggle with things like ADHD uh, and that, that impulsivity. Um, if that, that pause almost doesn't exist <laughs> it's an immediate reaction <laughs> so they what i've found is that is that if they can if people can buy into the notion that there is a bit of a pause you know a fraction of a second before you respond and if you can through meditation and mindfulness lengthen that pause a little bit so you can go like i did you know oh here's that anger again or here's that sadness again i'm this is what I'm going to do instead of what I used to do. And that's the idea right. I think, that for me that seemed to make right. sense. And it's interesting. This would have been, this would have been in the sixties, uh, 1960s. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I, before I think act ever came out into thing, right? That, that notion of acceptance. I think that's what we're talking about is accepting that we are humans and that we experience these things, but we have a choice how we want to respond. Right. Okay. And then here, I got a note here. 
maybe in this can transition us into. So as you, I think we also kind of paused as you were meditating, learning from your brother, shifting your education. Um, so you write here, college was truly inspiring. I had some amazing professors in philosophy, sociology, and psychology. I'm not reading their names. And without too much effort, I did very well. Working with young people and families who were struggling was exactly what I wanted to do. And I was totally invested in reading and learning as much as I possibly could about the field of counseling and psychotherapy. Joel and Brian were our two primary teachers in child and youth work, and I enjoyed all the courses immensely. But it was my placements at Whitby Psychiatric Hospital with adolescents in Scarborough General Hospital's 3040 clinic that cemented my love for the field. And maybe that's a nice way to get into that. There's so much in here we, that it's hard not to want to talk about it all. But yeah, how you got into the Whitby thing and maybe just talking about the stuff you mentioned around restraint and like the difference between you'd also tell a story about one person sort of pinning a patient down and sticking a needle in their butt, which was seemed a bit inappropriate to, to put it lightly, perhaps. And, and how, and I guess it's very hard for people to understand for lay people, right. To understand how difficult it is to deal with someone who is sort of psychotic or who was like really activated or just totally disconnected from reality. And I think we have very poor notions of what that's actually like. And I have a brother who lives with schizophrenia. He spent a lot of time actually at Ontario Shores, which was the the hospital that you worked at. But can you maybe just speak to that and sort of what you saw as actually being helpful in terms of learning to hold people in restraint in a way that helped them calm down? Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the, there were a number of characteristics that most of the kids had in common at Whitby. Um, one was that they had all been through uh, many different treatment modalities and centers throughout Toronto. And the Whitby was their sort of last stop kind of thing. A lot of the kids had been removed from the families. Um, so there, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think there was, we had, uh, uh, all the kids had severe attachment disorders, um, and they didn't trust any adults. And uh, and that was the biggest issue, I think. And the other, the third thing was that they had an incredible amount of anger and rage in them. Understandably, they were rejected mm -hmm. and and abandoned, and uh, and the society took over. And the, we know that the there were always problems with group homes and stuff. So they have, had not had a, a very positive experience. So my focus at that time was um, how do we just give them even a little bit of a positive experience? How do we sort of relate to them differently than every other adult in their life had related to them? And, and that for me was the key. So in other words, uh, the biggest thing was that when they would lose control, which was frequent, um, <laughs> and and we had to, and for various reasons, and sometimes it was because of staff, um, they would lose control, so they needed to be restrained. I felt there had to be a way to restrain them that actually would be a positive experience for them. So I related to where we were taught that, that there, you, after a physical restraint, there should be a debrief, a, a winding down with the client. And uh, so I sort of took that seriously, and that's what I focused on was how do we how do we hold the patient without hurting them, and until they've settled, and then how do we work through how to how to do that? And one of the things that we talked a lot about was that uh, it was like the kids wanted to be restrained; they wanted to to let loose, and they wanted right, to be right. restrained and controlled. Uh, and their experience had been that the way adult the adult world controlled them was harmful, was abusive. Um, so I mm -hmm. felt that if we could show them that that we can control you if you lose control without hurting you, and we can talk about how to not let that happen again. So um, that was my focus, and so I did a lot of focus on the on the debrief afterwards and the talking to them. Uh, most staff at Whitby didn't sort of buy into that, um, so it was uh, it was sort of an uphill battle for me. But the kids that I managed to connect with um, actually did seem to improve. 
you know, and I think that it was that that process of of holding them, restraining them, being kind and compassionate, and then talking to them about how to try and avoid that in the future. That never worked because, from their perspective, they didn't have much of a future, and and unfortunately, they didn't. Right. And was this around the time of the deinstitutionalization of mental illness and stuff like that, or had that happened? You know, this was before that. Yeah, this was. was I'm just curious. Early 70s. Okay, and I'm curious on your. It's also not in your book, but just since, like, what is your perspective on that? I think we're at a time where the impacts of the deinstitutionalization are being seen quite with a lot of homelessness, particularly on the West coast. And, and do you think we, there's a, or how might we just address it better? Because the other thing they said was in the deinstitutionalization, the resources would go to creating social supports for these people, but that never actually happened. I don't think. And I think that, that, that was the idea. And I think that, um, that was a good idea uh, because the institutions were horrible. Um, so that's a good thing that that happened. But I think like most other things, as human beings, we sort of go from one extreme to another. Uh, so if the institutions are bad, get rid of them. Uh, so then what do you do with all the people that were in them and people that needed that? Yeah. So that, I mean, that's the problem. We We sort of go to extremes instead of trying to be reasonable and think what's the best solution here because we need to provide services for these people. So yes, deinstitutionalization, but there needed to be places for these people to go to get treatment. And right. And those things never really no, happen. No. No. Even to this day, really. Well, right? Yeah, there's there's not a lot of uh I mean there's more sort of um uh like for homeless and stuff, there's more stuff available. But it's still a huge problem, and there's not enough money put into it to actually create places that are going to be helpful. Right. One thing I also wanted to point out, which I thought was quite nice and that shows up throughout the book, is I can consi- so I'm going to just read here quickly. I consistently made a point of connecting with the most experienced professionals in my field, but also in social work and particularly psychiatry. I wanted to become the most knowledgeable and effective therapist I could be. And you just talk about how much you learned from other people and how important that was in your whole development. And to me, the the word that came up is humility. So you have this nice humility about yourself and the world and how these things work. And maybe that also connects to how you managed to deal with the chronic pain when it all came. I'm not sure. So maybe... Just talk about that a little bit, and then that's where in the book sort of you start talking about the chronic pain. Yeah. Um, well, the thing about the uh, connecting with people, I mean, I was uh, I was very forward and blunt with people, um, you know, and and I and I made deals. So <laughs> I will take this kid on in individual therapy if you give me hour for hour supervision, and and I don't know maybe just because of my personality, whatever, everybody keep, kept saying, yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah, I had one uh, one psychiatrist, uh, Leon Sloman, who I worked with a lot, and he, I asked him, I said, I really want to get good at doing assessments and case formulations. Can you help me with that? He said, yeah, absolutely. So every, every family that we assessed, I wrote up the case formulation and, uh, and, gave it to him and he commented and sent it back and over the course of uh, the years that I was there which is nine years um, I learned so much from him and uh, got really good at assessing and formulating cases uh, and mm-hmm. even diagnosis which I'm not allowed to do but uh, I got good right, at right. being it <laughs> yeah and uh, right, right. and yep. having the hour for hour supervision was was crucial in continuing to learn how to how to do therapy. Right, right. Okay, and so all of these things are happening. You're developing your professional skills. You continue to practice sort of mindfulness and your own psychological skills and that kind of thing. And then the chronic pain arrives, so to speak. Yeah, so can you ex- sort of describe what that yeah, was like? Um, and, you know, we haven't talked about it really much yet, but it's the, you know, basis of a lot of this. It's so hard to so pick what to One talk of the about. things that uh, that uh, I used, I did 
was I made sure that when I was involved in a program, um, that I I, wa- I was in, interested in research too. So I wanted to I wanted to write up the program and I wanted to describe it and I wanted to measure change. Um, so I was I sort of published a couple of papers with uh, some with Leon Sloman and some with some other psychiatrists and psychologists that I worked with, and uh, and I enjoyed doing that. And I presented at a couple of uh, uh, psychological conferences um, on, um, at the time it was ADD, <laughs> and using cognitive therapy with ADD. Um, we were sort of trained and followed uh, uh, Donald Meikenbaum's sort of self-instructional training model, um, which in my opinion is the best out there, was then and still is now. Um, but um, I was scheduled to present uh, at a at a uh, conference in Philadelphia on uh, in November 1981, and uh, I got a ear, nose, and throat infection uh, on the Friday, and went to the doctor, and he said, "You can't fly anywhere, you can't go anywhere." So I had to call the psychologist that I worked with, Chris Webster, and said, "I can't go," and he said, "Okay, I'm going anyway, so I'll I'll present it." So that was great. But the weekend was the worst, most painful in my face and head that I'd ever experienced, uh, except for that below uh, in the forehead that one time. And uh, but the uh, on the tractor, yeah, yeah the tractor. Um, so uh, it was really bad, and uh, my doctor put me on antibiotics for seven days, and the the infection cleared apparently. Um, but I was left with this pressure and pain in my sinuses, the frontal sinuses, across my forehead. Um, and so I went back to him and said, I still, you know, the infection's gone. I still got this pain here. And he said, uh, well, keep taking the decongestants for another week and see if that helps. And it didn't. So that started it. That's when the, that that sort of pressure and pain has never gone away, except for when they injected me with nerve blocks. Um, yeah, so that was the start of it. And um, mm-hmm. I was 30. Yeah. All right. And, and, and so then in the book, you kind of describe, <laughs> I love, there's one example or a couple examples you get of, give of sort of bad treatment, but you were started to seek everything you possibly could, yeah. right? To help yeah. yourself. And the, prob- yeah. the problem and, with and, that is that, yeah. that I, what I was looking for was to get rid of it completely. I wanted to find right. something that would right. get rid of it completely. And when I went to, to all these things and I'd get a little, feel a little better from them. And I just said, no, it's not enough. Not enough. That was the big problem. Right. I, I just want to read yeah. this because it's so funny. <laughs> you just described this thing about going to a shiatsu therapist <laughs> who, ex- <laughs> who explained that my headaches were caused by tight muscle knots in my neck and back, which would require deep tissue work. The pain from this work was unbearable. Is it supposed to hurt that much? I asked. Absolutely, he said, and your experience of the pain confirms that it is a deep tissue problem. <laughs> I never went back for another shiatsu session. Yeah. <laughs> that was so yeah. funny. Um, and so as you sort of described to the big problem was that you were trying to get rid of the pain. And maybe can you kind of talk about that? Because that's obviously at the core of most, I assume, most chronic conditions, but in particular, chronic pain. And, and as you describe a lot, and then one of the chapter six is into the abyss. So I think as you were trying to get everything to stop it, you kind of got worse yeah. and worse. Yeah. Right? And then, um, and it's the, it got really worse when, um, unfortunately, when I started on the narcotics and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and for the first six months I was on the narcotics, I felt great. The pain wasn't gone completely, but it was down low enough that I actually was feeling happy, also partly from the narcotics, I suppose. Um, right, but right. Uh, but also, and I and I lost weight, which I was happy about. Um, and uh, that first six months was was great. So I was hooked into the fact that that the narcotics were really helpful, and I was worried about addiction. So I had a conversation with my pain specialist and uh, about the addiction process and the fact is one of them said to me listen you have uh, you have you go away for the summer 
uh, I went to camp for the summers. You go away for the summer and you take, um, you know, 25 patches of 200 milligram of fentanyl with you and you don't overuse and you have a, a bottle of morphine pills at your bedside and you don't take more than you're supposed to. So we don't think you're addicted. We think you're just dependent on the medication for pain relief. So that resonated with me. So I kept going and, uh, and then the pain started to get worse and worse in spite of going up higher on the medications, uh, trying different ones. I think I've tried pretty much everything there is and, uh, and it was all not working and it was actually making things worse. And that was the, my new pain specialist decided that that that's what's happening is, is the medication you need to come off it. So he was telling me for the, the, and my wife was telling me for the two years prior to when I went to CAMH, the medical withdrawal unit, um, that I needed to get off the medications. And by that time it was okay. Yeah. 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 And I th by that time I was in bed most of the time at home, but I was still functioning at work. Right. And, and I think it's so common for people and clearly there's a over prescribing of these medications in the world, the painkillers in particular. Yeah. And in the book, you really detail a lot of it in the whole process, which is pretty intense um, to, to hear about, I guess, to, for lack of a better description. And, and here, I just want to read uh, what you're right. Cause this is obviously, well, not obviously, but there's a lot of people in this situation right now as we speak and who are probably grappling with all these kind of things. And I think hearing people like yourself talk about it is so useful. So I'm just going to read a bit pointing to what you were just saying. Eventually it became clear that I was dependent on the narcotics for pain relief and that I was not chasing any high from the medications. The quote unquote experts had convinced me that the body uses the narcotics to treat the pain, not to get me high. There was always a large quantity of narcotic medications within reach on my bedside table, but I was usually able to resist the temptation to take more than was prescribed. I believed I was quote unquote dependent, not addicted, a solid rationalization. I manipulated my use of the medications by adding heat to the fentanyl patches during the last few hours before I could put a new patch on. I would also split up the dose of triazolam to see if it would keep the pain under 7 out of 10. This manipulation seemed to be helpful as it was administering the medication differently, but this beneficial effect also wore off with time like everything else. And I love that you use the word rationalization because in, in the 12 step addiction world, they often, they say rationalize, justify, minimize. And, and I know it's a little bit different in this context, but the, the way the mind thinks in that way is very yeah. similar. Well, yeah. You, you and so how does anything? Yeah. Uh, that, right. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. And so how did you, that's the next part in the book here is the detox, right? And the yeah. withdrawal, the climbing right. out. Um, how did you get from that to, I, I guess you said you had a, a specialist suggesting you go off the narcotics yeah. and everything. And how did that mis decision come about? And can you just talk to people about the detox and the withdrawal and, and how you managed that? Yeah, um, it was, uh, wow, well, it was um, it was difficult to come down and make that decision. But uh, like I said, it took me a couple of years to, to come to the realization that I actually did have to do that. Um, so once I made that decision, I had two close friends, Judy and Clyam, who were both in addictions and, uh, and said, look, go to this guy who's a specialist in addiction, talk to him, share him the, your story and see what he thinks. And he was the one, he was great. And he was the one who said, you know, you are dependent on the narcotics. There's no question about it. Um, the addiction issue isn't something that we need to talk about at this point. But you need to get off, and the only way to do that is to go to the medical withdrawal unit at CAMH. So he was the one who referred me, and uh, and I went in, and I was in uh, for seven days, and it was uh, the first, probably the first four days, three days in particular were were horrible. I mean, it was a constant sort of nausea, vomiting, um, everything else, uh, and. Uh, they uh what did they they gave uh, i think for the first three days i 
was able to have one out event to try and get to sleep at night. Um, and but by day five, uh, I was starting to feel great. And it was a, it was in the May, I think it was in May one year, 2010, um, that I sort of was able to go outside and walk around the area outside. So I did. That's where I did most of my meditating, walking meditation, and uh, focusing on on what was happening. And um, I had all sorts of weird visits from people who were dead, uh, which was interesting. <laughs> and and also, I think that it's so hard to describe, but the decision to do this, there's that tension for anybody who has to make a very big decision like this to change or to detox or stop using something. Do you have any words that make sense to you or when you think about trying to describe that decision to people, how did you come to that decision? Um, because I focused on the, in my, I continued to meditate through this whole time. So, and my right, focus right. was, was on what's happening to my primary relationships what's going on and i and i realized that that it was having a huge negative impact on all of my primary relationships my wife and my two boys and uh um i wasn't able to spend the quality of time that i wanted with them and even when i did um i was still caught by the pain you know um yeah. so we would go we would my wife and i would go out for dinner with friends and after dinner, about a half hour after dinner, um, I was done, and I just go up to a bedroom and lie down, listen to my self instructional or my self uh, hypnosis tapes and recordings, and try and stay focused on any anything that was not the pain. Um, so that was what, that. I realized that if this is not a good life, I was waking up every morning thinking, you know, fuck, I don't really want to be here. You know, and, and mm -hmm. you know, when I take my medication, I, I used to always sort of go, oh, why don't I just take that all? I mean, this is crazy. Um, and I yeah. sort of said to myself at the time that this is ruining my, my life and my relationships and my family. And the only way out of it is to get off this stuff. Right. Well, that was the, and I guess, yeah, I guess they often say, you know, until we're in enough pain, we won't change kind of idea. And, and so that's similar to what I guess you're describing. And, and it came from the external things, right? The things that matter to you in your life. Okay. I want to read another part here. So this is in the chapter, like uh, as you're finding your way out, I purposely held back on the deeper thoughts because I was afraid of giving them more power by actually saying them out loud. It is a dilemma because I encourage patients and clients to do the opposite and share their struggles with troublesome thoughts and emotions openly because it actually weakens them. However, the fear of the negative impact on others has always been too powerful for me to stand against. I would try to reason with myself. Look, you advise kids and parents to open up with each other, to share their pain and to be honest. You have seen this help their relationships, so why can't you do the same? That's pretty deep. It's still a struggle. And, and and I'll tell you why I think it's still a struggle, because it has to do with the chronic daily pain. The fact is that when I talk to clients and patients and parents about uh, open communication and sharing uh, difficult thoughts and, and emotions, um, it does help them, and it does weaken the the the, the, um, the difficult emotions, uh, and it increases the the power of their relationship in a positive way, because yeah. parents can do something different. Um, parents can do something to help their kids to to be more open, to accept their negative thoughts and emotions, whatever they might be, and to validate that experience for them, right? And then the kids get better, right? The problem is with chronic pain is that my sharing those deep, dark thoughts and emotions, um, there's nothing anybody can do about it. There's nothing anybody can do to relieve that. So, that, so it, it becomes, I see it as more of a burden with struggling with chronic pain. Unfortunately, it sort of leaves you to deal with it yourself. Uh, right. And, and yeah. I think the, the you know what to be frank, the only reason I'm still here is because of my meditation practice. 
you know, that's the only reason. Because in the meditation practice, I can connect with that, with the positive uh, sense of, of being, and, uh, and I can ground myself, and I can focus on what's important in life, and that I'm doing my best, right? And that me right. sharing this yeah. with my wife, for example, would just put her in a position because she can't do anything about it. So I, have, I still struggle with that issue. How much, yeah, yeah. How Thank much you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that just that sounds very difficult, and I assume many people in similar situations must struggle with that tremendously. Can you distinguish? So, how do you distinguish between or sharing that you're kind of having a hard time or something like that with? And I don't know if I'm making sense here, but it seems though that. And you do kind of write it a little bit in the book, but when you do acknowledge to the people around you that you're having a difficult moment because of the pain, so to speak, is that different for you? Can can you share a little bit about the struggle without kind of burdening them, or is it kind of more one way or the other for you? And does that question make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think that um, I think people learn to uh, to see it. Um, so. Yeah. People that I'm close with can tell <laughs> when I'm having a bad day, and uh, and yeah. they just give me space so I can go and do whatever I need to do uh, to sort of take care of it as best I can. Uh, so whether that's going, right. it's usually going to uh, a bedroom and turning the lights out and uh, putting my self hypnosis recording on. I have recordings for sleep, for pain, for uh, all sorts of stuff, and um, and that sort of helps me to drop into that meditative state. And uh, so I do it. I I spend a fair bit of time in trance. <laughs> <laughs> and and can so then can you describe? I guess your process of dealing with it. So you you did the detox thing, um, and then you kind of had to find some way to fucking deal with all this. So can you sort of start, tell us a bit like how that all evolved? Um, well, that, I think that uh, <laughs> complicating <laughs> factors um, is that um, in 2014, I had low back issues. So I was diagnosed with uh, uh, spinal stenosis. And um, so that became daily pain added to my headaches. Um, so it was like, uh, okay, what the fuck is going on now? And, uh, I had yeah. to figure out how to sort of manage that. So I went to physio, um, did physio exercises every day. I started doing yoga every morning, at least for 15 or 20 minutes. And that was a little helpful, but once again, it didn't take the pain away completely, but I stayed away from any narcotics. Uh, so um, I was taking, you know, extra strength Tylenol and Advil. One of the things they told me when I left the CAMH medical withdrawal unit was um, to combine Advil and, and Tylenol at the same time because they act on different centers in the brain. So you can get added relief when you take them both together. Yeah. So, And then my pain specialist said, no, stay away from Advil and Aleve because the uh, it they said that in later life that can cause stroke, and <laughs> there's always something that can cause, right? Uh, anyway, but I ended up right. taking, uh, you know, uh, a dozen tile, extra strength Tylenol a day, uh, and people would say, well, if it's not doing the job, why take it? Well, because it drops the pain by a notch, and, and a notch is significant, right? A difference of a notch can help me to conduct a session uh, being fully present um, rather than having to be pulled away from by the pain. I want to read one other thing here and also point to, so I'll read it first and then I'll ask. Um, when I spend time in bed trying to control the pain now, I am flooded with thoughts of all the things I should be doing as a partner, as a father and grandfather. But I have learned to accept these experiences and then shift away from them to the job of reducing the pain so I can be more involved as much as possible. Then the thought appears again. I could live another 20 
years like this, fuck me. <laughs> and then, and then over on the next page, I guess you talk about how, so here's the bad habits are always more effective because the intention to get immediate relief is more powerful than the intention to reduce self-harm behaviors. However, in the long run, creating more positive habits is a healthier solution. So I think not only for chronic pain, but certainly it must be so much more difficult, quite frankly. Can you talk about, and I assume, well, I know from listening to you and learning from you that so much of people's transformation or change or healing comes from acknowledging, you know, how could I live another 20 years like this? Fuck me to, to the trans transmission or the change or the transformation of that into acceptance, I guess. And how, can you just talk about how you work with acceptance and what yeah, that's like? I think that, um, I mean, accepting the reality of the situation, I think is always important. Um, and I think that's one of the, the sort of foundational things of, of the act uh, modality uh, is accepting that these things happen and these things come. Uh, and then uh, the question then is you have to decide on what you do about it. And uh, for me, um, the fact that I can accept that, that I have this pain and that I have uh, even more pain now daily um, one of the things I came to realize that was that if I make sure that at some point every day I find some joy, even if it's only a few minutes, that I can look back on and say that I like that. That was really good. That was important. I don't want to lose that. Um, and I'd like to try and build that more. Um, so, so that becomes my focus that, that I accept that the pain is there. I do what I can to alleviate it. I try and shift and focus on on the joy in life and the value in life. When I walk, uh, when I go for a walk, uh, I often have the thought, um, you know, this this could be the last time I ever get to do this. All right? We don't know when our time is going to come. Uh, also, don't know where we're going, but uh, <laughs> if anywhere, uh, that's another topic. Um, but saying, you know, like yeah. this could be the last time, which means I want to make sure I get the most out of this. I want to see everything I see. I want to smell everything, all the senses, you know. Um, and that mm -hmm. keeps me very focused on being mindful of the moment. And when I do that, because we are only able to focus on one thing at a time, right? I mean, we're good at multitasking, but we actually can only focus on one thing at a time. Yeah. So if I'm focused on the five senses of what I'm experiencing, then the pain uh, right away shifts to the background a little bit. Yeah, and I sort of yeah. recognize that, and I wanna and I wanna try and build on that. I'd love to be able to shift it away completely, but I can't do that. <laughs> right. And I still cry sometimes, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to read another piece from in similar context. So you say, I am increasingly encouraged about the power of our minds to change sensations throughout our bodies, temperature, tension, pain, heart rate, blood pressure, and emotions. After establishing a foundation of daily practice of diaphragmatic breathing, control has never meant stopping emotions, negative or positive. Perhaps we should shift away from the term negative and positive and instead talk about difficult and enjoyable. Emotions often rise and recede like the ocean tide, and all emotions need to be accepted and experienced fully. It is important to work through the difficult emotions and fully embrace the enjoyable ones without trying to hold on to them. As we all know, they too pass. Chronic pain also rises and recedes even though the pain may never go away completely. To establish control over painful emotions, I must recognize when they are rising, understand and accept them without judgment, spend time with them so they settle, then shift my focus to other more pleasant endeavors. And I guess that's what you just kind of described there. I, can you talk a bit about, I see this when working with people, when things do start to change and they have good moments and life gets good for them, they have to relearn that not attaching to that is important too <laughs> and not getting carried away in the good and thinking that's how it's supposed to be either and so you just you you point that out here so nicely and and so 
maybe you can expand on that or maybe you already well, you did. Want, you want our, I mean, it's, it's a natural thing to want to hold on to happiness and joy, realizing that we can't hold on to it for good. It'll last as long as it'll last. You want to just enjoy it as fully as possible while it's there uh, and not try and hold on to it. Because I think what happens when we do that is we get into a pattern, like everything else, we get into a pattern of um, being upset that we don't have that anymore. Right? Uh, I had all of that. Mm. That was so good. I wanted to hold it. And I couldn't. Shit, I fuck. And, you know, and that's not helpful. And, and it leads it, it it actually then I think develops into that the the way people start to just try and avoid happiness because they can't hold on to it. Mm -hmm. What's the point? Yeah. That thought comes. What's the point? I'm going to lose it anyway, right? Yeah. It, it's, wow. And yeah, getting past that. Right. And how I guess we didn't talk about too many of the details, but you really outlined in the book all the different things that you tried to do and have done to manage the pain and et cetera. Yeah. And you keep coming back to sort of meditation or mindfulness being the core component of that. And can you maybe just talk to us a bit about you write rituals and then towards the end of the book, you maybe talk about another book that might be forthcoming yeah. about building a foundation um, and a structure upon which your daily sanity and well-being <laughs> rests and I love that you use that word, my sponsor in AA would always okay. say, you need to dig a deep, deep, deep foundation, yeah. because if you don't, then life's going to kick you in the face and you're going to fall over and kind of yeah. crumble. So maybe, yeah, just how do, what is sort of the, the, the extent of the rituals and the habits and, and how you manage this from day to day and how important that sort of foundation upon which yeah. you can have a life? Well, I sort of have come to the, the realization for me anyway, and I think it's probably like this for other people, uh, that um, we experience uh, chronic pain physically somewhere in our body. Yeah? We exper experience that pain every day. And um, what happens is that our mind determines what we do about that, yeah? So that we, we experience the pain and it's our mind that sort of figures out what to do or just reacts, yeah? And, mm -hmm. and our mind is, is, uh, is a, whole, a whole bunch of uh, automatic habits that we've developed over time, right? So one of the things that I've come to is that if I imagine my mind as a as as a I'm renovating a house, yeah, I want to start at the foundation and make sure that there is a good solid foundation there, and that foundation for me is meditation and mindfulness. Um, so that has to be, from my perspective, that has to be a daily practice, and it's not it's not um, you're not doing it to get enjoyment. You're doing it to create a solid structure of how to move through life, yeah? So mm -hmm. it's doing that, even if it's only for five or 10 minutes. Uh, when, I'm, when I wake up in the middle of the night with a bad headache, I don't want to get up at the usual time in the morning and do the exercises. I don't want to do that. It's, it's so powerful that I don't want to do that. But I'm not doing it for enjoyment. I'm doing it because that's a skill I have to have. Right, so that foundation is the key piece, and then it goes from there. You sort of go to your sort of beliefs and values. Yeah. So what do I believe about this? Um, and and the beliefs and values have to do with emotions as well. So when that that emotion comes, that I just I can't do this anymore. I can't. This is just too frustrating and too hard, and it's upsetting me. Um, I have to figure out what to do with that. And I know I have to accept that it comes because it's going to keep coming. And uh, but I can do something different about it. Yeah. And that's where the foundation comes into play. That kicks in. That sort of meditation, the diaphragmatic breathing, kicks in, and all of a sudden I'm transported to a different space. And and then it goes up from there. You work on the floors of beliefs and attitudes and uh, what uh, what sort of motivates you. Yep. Yeah. 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 I guess it, it takes a lot of <clears throat> discipline and courage, I guess, and the willingness to really stick to it. I can only imagine how 
I, I'm having, I have a, a stress fracture in my lower back. I just got my x-rays back. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not to compare it, but it's the, the notion of, I don't want to accept it and I just want to complain and I don't want to do anything. Like I know certain stretches and whatever will help me and blah, blah, blah. But I still don't think I've really surrendered to this being my reality and just kind of, cause it doesn't seem like it's ever going to go away. So yeah. How do you, <laughs> I mean, I guess we talked about how you stick to yeah. that, but, but you have to, you have to, you, but, you can't stick to something constantly unless you're an Olympic athlete. And you have yeah, this right. habitual pattern of, of uh, working. Um, mm -hmm. There are days where you just, you know what, I can't, I can't. And and what happens, what the tendency is for that to become another day and another day, right? So you, right. you feel right. the same way every time you wake up. So so if you if you skip it this day, then it's okay to skip it another day. And and you have to get into a, a habit of of not giving into that so that if you mm. skip a day you have to forgive yourself but you can't let it happen again right away you want to make sure like it, like i said even if you just do it for a few minutes you can look back on the day and say at least i did it a few minutes yeah right. and then yeah. getting yeah. back into the what what's really helpful right and and in that in that sense i guess one question or one thing that I think if you had any sort of um, parting words for people with chronic pain and just, you know, we've already talked about a whole bunch of things, obviously, but any last kind of words to help them work through it? Um, and then I have one last question after I that. I think that it's a, one of the, for me, the most important thing is that you have, a, you have created and developed and strengthened the space inside you um, where the pain isn't present. Um, so I don't have, <laughs> I do actually at the moment, but usually I don't have pain in my abdomen and stomach. Um, so uh, that's where my sort of safe space is. When I do a deep diaphragmatic breath, I drop into that space. And because I'm focused on that space uh, and sort of mindful of whatever I'm focusing on at the moment, the pain recedes. So it doesn't it doesn't interfere in that space, and I could spend whatever time I want there. Uh, sometimes I need to listen to the guided meditation that I do to get there, um, to get past the pain. Uh, but once I'm there, I'm good and there, and I can stay there for a little bit of time. So, And doing that every day, I think, gives you some hope that you can keep doing that, and you want to even try and build right. the time you can, you can feel um, life without that pain. Right. And, and okay. So my last kind of question is the, and I'm not sure how you think about this in terms of, this is a bit more of a mindfulness question, the, the dual non-dual uh, discussion in, I guess, Buddhism. And, and so that's the no self versus the self and experience idea. Yeah. I've never been able to get in, my head in, around the no self piece when you describe the sense of you recede into the background of your experience, so to speak. Right. So the, at least as I understand it, it's this, the, there is no me self or I behind my face that experiences life, right? Even the me self I behind my face is an appearance in my conscious awareness, like a feeling yeah. or a thought. Um, and I assume, or maybe I, it seems to me that's kind of what you're describing in your relationship to the pain in some sense is that it's just happening and it's here. And if I can remove this sense that it's happening to me. So for me, it's if, if I'm attached to that sense of me, self and I, then everything that happens to me is a slight against me kind of idea, right? It's like, you're doing this to me. This is about me, poor me, poor me, all that kind of shit. Um, so I guess in your experience, when you're going through these practices and the discipline it takes to do it is a lot. Right. And you actually also mentioned in here, and it's sort of similar to one thing I've heard John Kabat-Zinn say, all the things that come up in our minds, you know, this is a waste of time. I shouldn't meditate right now. You have other more important things to do than just sit here and do nothing. And, 
And then you say, it turns out that meditating could be the most important thing we can do for our physical and mental health. Yeah. And I think I certainly agree with that. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that was kind of a jumbled thought of, of how you kind of center the you behind these experiences and can you let that go? Well, yeah, I, I mean, or, that, you do yeah, let that go. And that's a struggle, right? Because when you sit to meditate, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out what to do with the I, me, myself, all the different parts of the self, yeah? And and you can get right, stuck yeah. in that and, and that can turn you off meditation, yeah? Um, which is another <laughs> yes. reason why I talk about creating that safe space inside you so that you, you have a space to go where none of that matters. Okay? And I think that the two things that stand out for me and always have is that I believe that there's a part of our self, right, that, uh, that I call the observing self, that uh, Thomas Moore called the original self. So Thomas Moore talked about the original self. We are all born with an original self that is not... Uh, affected by the environment yet. And then we go through all these experiences and that original self gets buried. People start to judge what you're doing, tell you things are wrong, you shouldn't do it this way, and that starts to bury that original self. So I think of the original self as the observing self, the part of you that is different from the I, me, myself, all that stuff. It's the part of you that says that. Part yeah. of you that can step back from your life and your relationships and your body and what's going on and look at things uh, from a different perspective. Now, that I use a lot in the hypnosis that I use with people. Um, they can connect with that observing self when they go back. If we do a retro, if we do a, uh, um, a timeline and go back in time and go back to an event, um, they can connect with that observing self once they have a safe space. They connect with the observing self. They go back to a period of time, a traumatic event even, and they can uh, imagine them this observing self up on the ceiling in the corner watching what's happening, not affected by it emotionally, just watching as an observer. And they can create more distance from that if they need to, if the emotion starts to affect them by looking through binoculars and, and making the distance further. Mm. And, and then they can, and then it's now do a 360. And most of the time people will see things in that event, in that experience that they didn't realize at the time. Um, and, and oftentimes that's very helpful in them, sort of accepting that these kinds of things happen and that they're in the past mm -hmm. and that they don't have to affect you now. It's that observing yeah, self wonderful. that I think wow. is... is is part of my ongoing work. Right. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I guess to say it, the book is chronic pain, my journey. I took off the sleeve to go read through it as we were going along here. And yeah, Don, just thank you. I imagine you're experiencing some of that pain right now oh, as yeah. we speak. And so thank you. Thank you for being here and, and sharing this and giving your time. It's My pleasure. Uh, a privilege to, to listen. Yeah. And any, I guess they can wear, I know I got the book yeah. on Amazon, but what's your website and how do you direct people to um, the book? It, well, it's either on Amazon or they they also have copies at Caversham Books um, and Barnes and Noble and uh, Kindle. Yeah. Nice. And what's and what's the, your website? Website is donshunter.org. Okay, and all that stuff will be in the in the show notes and et cetera. If anybody wants yeah. to check that up, check that out. And yeah, okay. thanks all again, right. Don. Any last anything else you want to no, say? No. Or have a good day. No, good. Okay, thank you, okay, Don. Take okay, take care. Take it easy.